I want to welcome you to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church, and I want to wish everybody a happy Father's Day and also a happy anniversary to me and Jeannie. And it is a pleasure to be able to bring the Word of God to you. We're going to pick up the action in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6, beginning in verse 9. When Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. This is the word of God, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the preaching and the delivery of the word of God. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be infidelity and faithfulness to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Some people say, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to see God. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see my loved ones again. I'm going to be in the most beautiful place in the universe. And then other people say, I want to go to heaven. I just don't want to go right now. <laughs> I have things to do, places to see, relationships to cultivate. Maybe when I'm old and gray, then I'll be ready to go to heaven. And then other people say, well, if heaven is just a never-ending perpetual worship service. I'm sorry, but you can count me out. I can handle church for an hour a week on Sunday, but I don't think I would enjoy 24 hours of church all the time. Well, we'll deal with that last issue, but first I want to talk about what heaven is like and what eternity is going to be like for the people of faith and then we're going to make sure that you know how to get there, because that's absolutely crucial and critical. Let me begin by issuing a disclaimer. Not everybody is going to heaven. How do I know that? Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does my Father's will who is in heaven. For many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles and raise the dead and all kinds of stuff? And Jesus will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. A true child of heaven accepts Christ as Lord and Savior and demonstrates the authenticity of their salvation by doing the Father's will on earth worshiping Jesus, loving others, and extending grace, forgiveness, kindness, and compassion when appropriate. But the person who rejects Christ and disobeys him to his dying breath will be told by Jesus, I don't know who you are. You're not coming in. Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So as we turn to Revelation 6, keep in mind that this message about heaven is a huge comfort for the Christian and hopefully a huge challenge and incentive for the non-Christian to consider the claims of Christ and come to faith in the Lord Jesus before it's too late. The last book of the Bible is called Revelation because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ and his victory over the powers of darkness. And Revelation 6 describes the first waves of judgment that come upon the people who are enemies of Christ and the church. In Revelation 6, Jesus has a Roman-style scroll in his hand with seven seals on it. And every time he breaks open a seal, a judgment of God breaks out upon the unbelieving population. The opening of the first seal represents military conquest. The second seal represents war. The third seal represents taking away of peace and famine and inflation. And the fourth seal represents death, affecting the global population so that 25% will die during the latter part of the tribulation period. 
but it is the fifth seal in Revelation 6 verse 9 that concerns us today because that's the part that refers to heaven. The first four seals represent the judgment of God upon the earth, but the fifth seal represents the justice of God for his people. Verse 9 says that when Christ opened the fifth seal, I saw the, the souls of Christians under the altar of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony they maintain. The altar is in God's temple in heaven, and it's where prayers are offered, and it is where incense is offered. But underneath the altar are the souls of Christians who have died on account of their bold, brave faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, what are they doing down there? Why are they underneath the altar? Well, Leviticus 4 talks about the sin offering. And when that is offered, the blood of the bull is sprinkled on the horns of the altar, then the rest of it is poured out under the base of the altar as a sacrifice offering to the Lord. The slain are pictured here as a sacrifice to Jesus Christ, poured out under the altar of God. Right away, I think about the 21 Egyptian Christians executed by ISIS. Some of them were softly and tenderly praying to Jesus for help as they were killed. They were literally being poured out as an offering before the altar of God. And sometimes I think the world is such a scary place, and that is such a scary situation. I don't know how I would react if I was wearing the orange jumpsuit. I don't want to ever go through anything like that. I hope nothing like that ever happens to me or anybody I know. And then I think, wait a minute. It would be an honor to go through something like that. It would be an honor to lay down my life for the one who laid down his life for me. It would be an honor to boldly suffer and die for the cause of Christ and enter into glory and into the presence of God. Sometimes I get butterflies before a church service. No particular reason. It doesn't happen all the time, but once in a while it does. And if I ever feel myself losing my nerve, I go back to my office and I quote Proverbs 28, verse 1, which says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And then I'll walk around my office going, And it's not because I'm going crazy. It's because I'm getting my bold on. I'm getting brave. I'm building confidence to go out there and represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an honor to do that. And that's what these people were doing. They were getting their bold on for Christ. Revelation 12, verse 11 says, They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And then in Revelation 6, verse 10, it says, They called out to God in a loud voice. Remember in Genesis 4, when God told Cain, hey, your brother Abel's blood is crying out to me from the ground. That's what's happening here. The blood of the martyrs is crying out to God from the altar. And they are saying, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? This reads like Psalm 13. I call Psalm 13 the how long psalm. It says, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And then God gives each person a white robe. In the Jewish community and in the Roman community, white robes symbolized high status. So God is going to give the believer in Jesus Christ a robe of high status when they get into the kingdom of heaven. And then he tells them to wait a little while longer until the full number of those who are to be martyred have entered heaven. Now we learn in Revelation 4 that heaven is a place of wonder where the throne of God is surrounded by a rainbow and jewels of jasper and carnelian. And in Revelation 4 and 5, we learn that heaven is a place of worship because everyone's worshiping God and Jesus. But Randy Alcorn, in his book Heaven, mentions some things that we learn about heaven right here from the passage that we just talked about. Number one, when Christians die on earth, they immediately relocate to heaven. 
and live a conscious life. And that's important because there are a lot of groups out there like the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah Witnesses who teach that when you die, you fall asleep and you don't wake up again until the end of time. But we find out from here in Revelation 6 that that's not true, that people are awake and alive in Christ and calling out to him. Number two, you don't get reincarnated as somebody else after you die. You are always you, and you know who you are when you're up in heaven. Number three, people in heaven are recognized for their lives on earth. We'll know each other. These are the ones who died because of the word of God and the testimony they maintain. These are the ones who took a bold stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the ones who looked the beast in the eye and said, you can't win. Because if you should strike me down, I will enter into the presence of God into such joy and grace and bliss that you have never, ever known. The fourth thing we learn about life after death in heaven is that people are able to express themselves out loud. Verse 10 says, they called out with a loud voice. The fifth thing we learn about life after death in heaven is that people have a shared perspective. Notice it doesn't say that they called out in loud voices, but in a loud voice, suggesting that there is unity and a shared perspective on life in heaven. The sixth thing we learn is that the inhabitants in heaven are free to ask God questions. You know, sometimes if you're in school, you're afraid to raise your hand and ask a question because you think everyone's going to look at you funny, like how in the world did you not know that? You should have had that in your head. You don't need to ask questions. But God encourages us to ask questions. He loves it when we ask questions. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Mark. I thought we were going to know everything already when we got up to heaven. I mean, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 says that when we see Christ face to face, we will know fully even as we are fully known. But that means you're going to know Christ fully. It doesn't mean you're going to know every fact in the entire universe fully. Proverbs 10, verse 14 says that a wise man stores up knowledge. And that's not only true now, that's going to be true up in heaven, and that's going to be true later on when we're living with Christ on the new earth. And number seven, people in heaven know what's going on on earth. I used to think that that wasn't true, that we're going to be too busy worshiping God up in heaven to be paying attention to what's going on down there. But in this passage, the people know that they have been killed, and they know that the ones who killed them haven't been brought to justice yet. And number eight, people in heaven have a deep concern for justice and retribution. You know, you think, oh, I'm going to go to heaven, and, and I'm not going to care about the social or the cultural or the political situation going on on earth. But in heaven, you're going to have a deep concern that the justice of God come upon the earth. How long, O oh Lord, how long is it going to take before you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? How long is it going to be before all the wrongs that have ever been done are going to get righted? And then, number nine, people will remember their lives on earth, and they'll even remember how it ended. These guys remembered that they were murdered. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, how can heaven be heavenly if we're going to remember stuff like that. That doesn't sound so heavenly. Well, number one, the beautiful thing is that you're going to be comforted by God. Luke 16, verse 25, that says that after the poor man Lazarus died, he went up to heaven and he was comforted at Abraham's side. It feels good to be comforted. I remember when my father died, I was crying and my chest was heaving. But then Jeannie gave me a hug. She put her arm around me, and then she took me to Burger King, and I had a Whopper and a fry and a drink. And it feels good to be comforted, and it's going to be way good to be comforted by Almighty God. And another thing to remember is that we're not going to remember the bad things forever. When human history has run its course, God is going to clean the hard drives of our brain so he takes away all memories of the bad stuff. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Well, how do I know that? Revelation 21 verse 1 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then verse 4 says that God will live with us and he will himself be our God and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then number 10, we learn from our passage that we are going to have bodies in heaven because it says that we're going to wear white robes and later on in Revelation 7 verse 10 we're going to hold palm branches and worship the Lord and you can't hold the palm branch if you don't have a hand can't wear a robe if you don't have a body so we're not going to float around like ghosts up there we're going to have some sort of bodily existence in heaven you say all right pastor mark I understand that heaven is a place of wonder, it's a place of worship, it's a place of waiting so that God will bring justice to the world. But I gotta keep it real. If heaven's gonna be a 24 hour, seven day a week worship service, I don't know if I can get into that. My church service is long enough. I don't wanna do that for all eternity. Well, I don't wanna judge. I always tell people that this is a pastor's robe, not a judge's robe. But if that's the way you feel about worshiping God and loving God and praising God, then you need to check up from the neck up. You need to check your heart to make sure that it is still beating for God. Because we were created by God to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. How is it that we can get so excited about stuff and not get excited to worship the one who created the stuff? How is it that we can get so obsessed with athletics and not worship the God who created the athletes? It doesn't make any sense. We should give glory to the one who provides these things for our enjoyment, according to 1 Timothy 6.18. Having said all that, let me reassure you that eternity is not an endless worship service. John 14, verse 2, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back to take you to be with me. So there are going to be residences up in heaven. And the word for rooms refers to villas or suites or places to relax. So there's going to be opportunity for rejoicing, relaxing, and refreshment in the kingdom of heaven. And not only that, Heaven is our next destination, but it is not the final destination. You're going to come back with Christ from heaven at the end of the tribulation, and you're going to reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. I think it's pretty cool. After the thousand years are over, God is going to judge the wicked with finality, and then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and we're going to enjoy that and God forever and ever. How do I know that? Look at Isaiah 65, verse 17. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mine. And then it says, he who dies at a hundred will be thought at a, as a mere youth. People are going to live really long lives. They will build houses and dwell in them, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. I want you to circle that last word, enjoy. You're going to enjoy eternity with God. You're going to be able to build houses and plant gardens and go to parks and streams and rivers and lakes and be able to praise God for the beauty of the new heaven and the new earth and the glory of the skies. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, one more question. You said that we're going to do that for all eternity, but when I read the passage in Isaiah 65, it sounds like it's going to be for a long time, but not necessarily eternity. So how do I reconcile that? Well, long story short, Isaiah knew that we were going to live long lives, but he didn't know exactly how long that they were going to be. The Old Testament prophets only had a partial glimpse into the future. You get the rest of the story from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in John 3.16 that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then in Revelation 21 verse 4, John says no more death. No more mourning, and we will reign forever and ever.
That is good news. And then it says in Revelation 22 that God is going to make the whole earth a place of paradise. Randy Alcorn has a very interesting comment about this. He points out that people are always thinking about going on vacation and going up north, north to their cottages or their cabins or hunting or fishing and going to parks and rivers and lakes. And some people are thinking about going down to Florida to the beach or to the Keys or something like that. And he says the reason why we feel that way is because we have a longing for paradise. Adam and Eve were kicked out of paradise because they disobeyed God. And ever since then, there's been a longing in the human heart to be restored to the home God created for us. But someday, we are going to live in a paradise if we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, if we receive him as our Savior. And if you make Jesus the king of your life, you can start experiencing a little bit of paradise today. Because a relationship with Jesus is more satisfying than anything this world can offer. Amen? So I invite you to him. Make him the king of your life. And you will live with joy and eternal bliss forever and ever. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen.